Glad you could join us on another conversation on your premium business show. That's Business Redefined. Two months ago, I was moderating a conversation at the Affordable Housing Conference, and the subject of rent to own was quite emotive. And when we put it on Twitter, we received so much feedback. And why not have a, an expert in this area to help us flesh out the ins and outs of rent to own as, an, as a route to home ownership? Mr. Peter Mwangi from Walker Contours. Karibu sana. I'm glad to be here. Karibu sana, Tena. <laughs> Thank you. Peter, let's start from here. Um, there are many of us who might be watching and wondering, what exactly is rent to own? And many times the question emerges, is it the same as tenant purchase schemes? Please explain to us. Um, uh, rent to own essentially can be categorized in two areas. There is the rent to own with purchase obligation. By that I mean you have a lease or a tenant purchase agreement where the tenant also builds in the lease document binding purchase obligation, which means you agree on a purchase of a property, let's say for 10 million, that 10 million will be paid in installments over a duration of time, let's say for a period of 10 years or more, and it's the payment every month is deemed as a rent. The only difference being that that rent is a credit towards the final acquisition of the property, the purchase price that has been locked. So essentially pay a small amount just by way of deposit, a small percent, and then at the conclusion of the rent, then the property will be transferred to the tenant. So it is a lease agreement, but with binding purchase obligations. Uh, contrast that with where you have a lease with an option to purchase. In that case, it is a tenant arrangement like any other. The only difference is that you lock the purchase price, you give the tenant, the tenant buys an option to exercise the right to purchase this property at the conclusion of the period that had been agreed, or even earlier. So you have the right to purchase, that is the option, which you can exercise at any time during an agreed period of time. I see. And uh, Peter, when we have, whenever we have this conversation of uh, rent to own, one of the issues which emerges is that when you talk about when you're buying a house through the mortgage route, you have your deposit which you make. When you're coming to the rent to own, you have the lock-in which you start with. And the question has been asked, really, if the two demand almost the same thing, what really is the distinction here? Uh, the distinction is that is in the obligation that you actually incur. First, with the option or the rent to own, you find the initial amount that is required is only a small amount, it's a small percent. Whereas, and then, whereas in a mortgage, sometimes you find the bank is only giving you a mortgage of up to 90%, 10% you are, you are required to pay upfront, and also the obligation that ensue from there. Remember, in a rent to own, your agreement, although you have locked the price, the continued arrangement is that you are paying rent. That rent has a slight premium, no, not the rent that, is, that every other person is paying in the similar location, but you are allowed, the ownership is not vesting until towards the end. Whereas with a, a mortgage say, scenario, ownership vests immediately. That means the property title has to be transferred to you at the beginning, and you enter into a security obligation with a bank uh, that uh, now has tied you to payment. And the payment also comes in with the interest provisions that may vary uh, depending from time to time as per the arrangement with the bank. Whereas with the tenant purchase arrangement, you can be able to lock uh, a standard amount of installments that you pay, and it will only vary in very, very limited circumstances. But the ownership in the tenant purchase arrangement will only vest at the conclusion because the ownership remains with the landlord at this such time that you have been able to pay the final purchase. So let me walk you back. The lock-in in the case of um, a rent to own, and I know you have contrasted with the deposit in the mortgage, which typically is about 10%. What percentage of the value of the house do we typically look at when you're going to the rent to own when you're determining this lock-in? Um, the typical one that I've seen is it ranges. It ranges from 3%. So it's between 3 to 5%. And, and sometimes it can even be less, depending on how the, the developer wishes to approach it. Most developers now are getting interested in actually getting the unit sold as quickly as possible. 
and this rent-to-own arrangement is working better for them. So they're able to make it easier for someone to get in by lowering the initial requirement. So you find that typically 3% can be slightly lower. I see. You mentioned that uh, in the case of rent-to-own, the rent that I pay on a monthly basis via installments will typically have a premium over the average rent fetched in that area. So how do we arrive at this premium? Is it a factor of inflation or how does it work? It's actually a combination. It's a combination of the factor of inflation. There is also something that developer is also trying to put in a slight premium, uh, factoring into the time element that they are giving you, they are accommodating you. And so you find there is a slight premium other than what the other people in the same location are paying. But that premium then is, is balanced uh, when you factor in the, the time period you have been given to pay this. And, and the fact that you have got the flexibility of exit along the way without maybe uh, stronger uh, constraints that a mortgage would ordinarily give you. I see. When you talk about the um, options of uh, exit, and many of us are curious to know, in the rent-to-own arrangement, how does the exit clause look like? If I decided that I'm um, with this arrangement but it doesn't seem to be working for me, if I exit, um, how do I recoup my investment? Uh, what I've seen typically, because one thing that we are lacking with the rent-to-own arrangement is that we don't have legislation to guide the process. So a lot of it is contractual. But the contractual examples that we have seen is that at the beginning, you find the developer want to lock in the person they are contracting with. So there's a lock-in period of, let's say, two years, during which time they don't want you to exit or even to, to assign your interest. After that time, you have the flexibility of actually assigning your interest. And, and by that, that's now are the exit options that you have. If you find that you are not able to manage this arrangement or you have found a better uh, option or alternative somewhere else, you can always bring in someone who steps into your shoes and you can assign your right under that tenant purchase agreement and maybe with a slight premium for you because of the, you have locked the price and the developer ordinarily will have to give consent to that exit and the new person then steps in and you exit with what you're able to get out of it. When someone occupies a house in a rent-to-own arrangement, who is tasked with the routine maintenance of the house because I'm still on the rent to own, it is not my house yet, um, there's a developer in, in the question. That actually is the key aspect of contract making. At the time that you enter into this arrangement, that's one, one area that you have to be very clear about. Typically, the landlord or the developer, when they give you this house, they would try as much as possible to pass all obligations to the purchaser. So you have insurance obligations, maintenance obligation. They'll try to pass it on to you on the basis that this house is yours anyway. And so uh, depending on the negotiation that you enter with the developer, some developers would like to retain certain aspects of checking and ensuring the property is, is maintained and also to reserve the right to what is called step in and cure. In case they, you have taken the obligations to maintain the property or to insure and you are not doing that, they retain the stepping and cure provisions that will enable them to come in and cure whatever defects you haven't done and load that to the rent that you are supposed to pay. Or if you breach, they still reserve the right to step in, uh, and maybe you can discuss that a bit more, where they can step in and, and if they find that you're not able to continue to honor your obligations, to now put the property back in the market and sell it. So those obligations remain with you. So, but in some instances, you are able to, particularly with option to purchase, yeah. where the ownership uh, is just an option that you'll access in the future, there you'll find the, the landlord or developer will ordinarily continue maintaining uh, the property, but of course they add on those costs back to you. I see. Can someone sublet a house that they are in on a rent-to-own basis? Absolutely. The essence of a lease is the ability to assign or to even sublet. So other than for that period that I mentioned where the developer would like to lock you in, after that period, with the consent of the landlord uh, or the developer, you can sublet. And sometimes it may be even more economically better for you to sublet because if you get a rent that is able to cushion you for, for the rent that you're also paying, then that arrangement will work better for you. So Peter, one of the... Um 
in Kenyan's view, one of the strong value propositions around rent to own, or rather around real estate by and large, is the fact of um, appreciation, capital gains. And in this scenario of rent to own, whereby we agree on a purchase price upfront, and we are on this arrangement for a number of years, how do we handle this issue of the, the lock-in price? So the lock-in price is the contract. So you have locked it through the contract. But if you look at typically the uh, incident of capital gains tax, they now look at it from the point of transfer. So the transfer is sometimes in the future. But remember, the price has been determined. So uh, particularly for stamp duty, stamp duty you will pay only at the tail end when the property is, is transferred based on the purchase price that you have indicated. One of the areas that requires legislation in terms of input is to how to deal with that aspect. Because obviously, 10 years down the road, the price as you'll be indicating as what your purchase price is may at variance with what the collector of stamp duty would consider. But remember, you locked in this price you know, 10 years ago. And so that is one area that has a bit of a gap in how legislation should treat it. Because as, as I indicated, one area that we are lacking in rent to own is that we don't have legislation to govern that process. We don't have consumer protection laws that deal with aspects and gaps within the arrangement. Quite a bit of it is contractual. So ordinarily on the face of it, some duty is supposed to be based on the transfer price at the point of transfer. And even capital gain tax, if you are to look at it, will be at that point because it's for the point of transfer. I see. Peter, I know you've touched on uh, a number of taxation elements which affect uh, issues around transfer of property, but help us understand the question which normally emerges around what are the cash benefits of rent to own versus mortgage? I mean, the immediate thing is that, first of all, there's a bit of relaxation in terms of entry point. You know, the entry point is more flexible for a rent to own uh, rather than a mortgage. The, the, both in terms of your initial costs, what uh, the tax people will call adjusted costs, in terms of what you need to pay uh, at the beginning, in terms of stamp duty. Uh, remember, there's a delayed payment of that stamp duty. Whereas in a mortgage scenario, not only do you have to pay what the bank wants as upfront payment in terms of commitment fee, but you also have to ensure that the full purchase price is paid at the beginning. So it means that if the bank uh, pays your full purchase price, then you are beginning to pay your installments at a very high end because it's the installment based on the total disbursement. Whereas in the rent to home, the whole purchase price is uh, spread out over 10 years or more, and so is a more flexible and more cost effective way of owning a property. This market is not short of um, dubious developers. And uh, some would say that we get extremely worried when we talk about a space in the real estate which has no legislation, is purely on contractual obligations. Don't you think that's a valid concern? Absolutely. It's a valid concern, more so that um, uh, without, without having proper due diligence on the property you are, you are targeting, without professional help, both in terms of legal, both in terms of surveyors, both in terms of other professionals that need valuations, you cannot do this properly. That, that means, because it's contractual, that contractual means that somebody, in this case maybe a lawyer, has to do a proper due diligence to ensure that the owner of this property, the registered owner, the developer selling to you, has valid title. Secondly, that developer has not borrowed on the same property they're giving you. Because if they're borrowed, then you also need to bring in uh, the, the lender who has uh, an interest. For, for, for example, it could be a block of apartments. Those block of apartments could be subject of a mortgage to a lender. You are buying one unit in that apartment. So you need to ensure that the lender is also brought in to ensure that the payments that you are making are also going to reduce the exposure and, and is going to the lender so, so that when it comes to exercising that option, the lender will has given consent from the beginning and will be able to honor and discharge that unit for you. So proper due diligence, very important in the root of the title, in terms of any you know, forward concerns that you may have, uh, and also in the certainty that uh, the, the transfer will not have any 
impediment at all. If it's an individual we're selling to you, remember in this country now we have got spousal consents and arrangement, so you cannot be entering into a rent to own with a, an individual who is who, who, without also including the spouse if, if they're, they're married. They also have to consent to, to that arrangement. So, uh, yes, you cannot do this without proper due diligence and proper contract. And really speaking about due diligence, uh, what are some of the things which, um, top of your mind, if I'm getting into a rent-to-own arrangement, I should be looking out for? I mean, absolutely, the, 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 to start off, you, you must have a search. You must have certainty that the owner is indeed who they say they are. You must also have a clearance that this title is not the subject of any irregularity in the past, uh, or no disputes, absolutely. As I mentioned, you must ensure it's free from what is called encumbrances. You don't have a lender behind this scenario. You must know the person who is selling to you. As I said, we now have spousal requirements for NSL, and, and we also must ensure that the development control approvals have been obtained from NEMA to any other approvals that are necessary for you to ensure that the vesting of ownership in your name is proper and valid. I see. Peter, if, um, if rent to own has all these sweeteners to potential homeowners, why is it not popular in Kenya? I would say um, for anything to, you know, to proceed, properly. There has to be a neighboring environment. In that I mean that the rent to own arrangement in Kenya is sort of, it has grown, in, it has grown on its own contractually without so much of government intervention of government enablers. There are no tax incentives today for the rent to own arrangement. There hasn't been. Uh, previously you have the Housing Act that, that, you know, that goes back to 1953. And, and you have a number of asset developments that came up, you know, at the point of independence. You have got um, Kemadi Estate and a few others. And those were sort of tailor-made for civil servants. Civil servants were the only people with a, a salary, sort of a bankable salary. And a so, yeah, a regular paycheck. So the government was able, uh, or even institutions were able to focus on them and enable them to own homes and to have um, that... Fund. There was a, there's a fund under that act that enabled that to happen. So that then was able to, to, to happen in a few estates. Absent that, all the other arrangements of rent to own are individual. Depends on the, on the appetite of a developer to develop a product and to see that the market has appetite for it. They don't have any tax incentives. And so unless, and there's no legislation to govern that. So now is the time that I'm seeing the government getting focused on legislation or, or there is a lot of talk about legislation to enable this to happen better, affordability under the affordable housing scheme. So if that is developed, then definitely there will be appetite for, for that. The appetite will grow. In the event that someone gets into a rent to own and they realize midstream that they're dealing with a rogue developer for that matter, what's the recourse? Um, there's always an exit because, as I said, it's contractual, and with rent to own, you are already buying into a unit that is already completed. So you have already done the due diligence to clear all those hurdles that you have ordinarily. It is not uh, open, you know. It's not. Uh, it's, 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 it's not really uh, a development that is not has not left the ground yet. So it's already developed, and you are able to move in immediately into that house. You have all your approvals. So the issue of rogue developer then is diminished in the sense that the ownership and everything is checked at the beginning. Okay. Yeah. In terms of integrating this uh, deeper into our policy, the question has been asked following our conversation uh, that um, we have an affordable housing program in this country which schemes skewed towards mortgage-based purchases. How can we ensure then that rent to own fits within this space? Absolutely. Actually, the, the policy consideration right now will be to develop legislation that sweetens the rent-to-own arrangement, that uh, removes clarity on some of those issues that we have discussed now about stamp duty element, capital gains element, what benefits do I have, you know, how am I protected from a developer who may wish to look for ways of saying there's a breach in the arrangement, consumer protection laws to ensure that that does not happen, um, to enable a tenant purchaser who has stayed for quite a duration to
to also be given time to cure the defects they have in a reasonable manner. Uh, that happens in most countries with a more reformed uh, rent-to-own arrangement. We like to have a similar arrangement here. So, so that as you get into this arrangement, you know that no one can surprise you overnight and tell you you're in breach, I want you out, and your house is now available because they have seen there is a appreciation on the value of that property and they are hoping that you can default and then they, you know, they kick you out. So such consumer protection laws and other legislat legislative enablers that would enable this to happen. Together with the tax incentives that come with the, with the affordable housing arrangement, that will work perfectly. Okay. Yeah. Earlier on, you mentioned something which I'd like to get back to, and that was the fact that um, one of the differences between this sort of arrangement and the mortgage one is whereas in the mortgage scenario, your interest could be variable. In this case, you have almost a fixed uh, installment you're paying. But you said there are certain circumstances under which this could change. What sort of circumstances would this be? I mean, there could be, there could be certain provisions that uh, are built in the contract. Remember, you don't have legislation for, for this. Yeah. But I've seen instances in some contracts where the developer says, look, if, if it becomes uh, difficult because of, of, like, if, let's say, the developer is taking up insurance pro provisions, and then it becomes more expensive for them to maintain insurance because of change of scenario, one thing or another. So it, they can build in more additional costs to maintain that. But it's all contractual. If you're able to take over all those obligations and, uh, so, so, and you're not in breach, as, so that developer does not have to come in and step and cure, you are able to manage better your expectation of what you'll be paying over the years. Okay. Peter, as we wrap up this conversation, what jurisdictions would you say would give us a best practice as to the, um, the scalability of rent to own and the impact it could just have? I think it would be important to have a look at UK. UK have arrangement and very reformed regulations relating to rent to own. Uh, they have got arrangement where even in ordinarily when you in certain confirmed zones where you occupy a property, there's an arrangement where you as a tenant can exercise the right to purchase at a predetermined uh, price, which is a discount to what the market rates are. Another jurisdiction to look at is Singapore, because Singapore has established rent-to-own arrangements yeah. that, that are based on encouraging home ownership for its citizens. They have the first homeowner. They also have the second home as an investment. So it's very well, uh, we've got very well developed regulations that you can actually borrow from. Okay. Uh, to close this conversation, Peter, and really I have to ask you this question. We are talking about real estate, home ownership at a time when we know that uh, capital gains tax has been bumped up from 5% to 15% courtesy of the Finance Act of 2022. Many are of the view that the real estate sector is extremely exposed as far as this is concerned. Do you think in your experience, do you anticipate that people will begin with holding transactions just because of this regulatory change? Absolutely, absolutely. I see this happening. It has happened before when the stamp duty was very expensive at uh, 6%. Ordinarily, if you find that uh, the capital gains tax has uh, jumped from 5% to 15%, it's a huge jump. And whereas we like to compare ourselves with other East African countries, uh, we don't have indexation in, in terms of uh, managing our capital gains. So uh, you find that there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment as to how that will be implemented. And what that will mean, because um, it's only a couple of years ago, in 2015, that capital gains tax was reintroduced after it had been suspended since 1987. So you find that even with the 5%, it was already a challenge to many people because of, of uh, looking back as to how you can manage the tax and how you can manage the cost that you have incurred over the years. So to make it to 15%, definitely, I know some... Uh, sellers will, will think twice or will reconsider the sale immediately as they see whether there is actually, uh, is, is, is actually the best way to manage the asset. So I'll see that there will be, definitely will be a dent in this. But Peter, uh, to counter your narrative, I was having this conversation with uh, Kerry last week when I was moderating a Twitter space conversation. And Kerry's argument is that if we bring in indexation, and by the way, for the sake of our viewers, indexation is how you factor in inflation such that you are not taxing the inflationary adjustment on the price of a property. 
Uh, the argument by Kerry is, look, if we went the indexation way, we would be having the, the wiggle room to bump up capital gains tax to as high as the corporate tax level, which is 30%. I mean, the, 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 the thing to consider is, why was capital gains tax suspended in 1987? you know, for those number of years. Other countries did not necessarily suspend. Why did Kenya take that option? And, and when it was introduced in 2015 uh, at 5%, what magic, you know, happened that will enable someone to really consider another jump to 15%? And, and, and what challenges have been witnessed since it was witnessed, since it was reintroduced? And taking into account the, what I mentioned before, when stamp duty was hiked uh, to 6%, you had so many challenges with how to compute the, the stamp duty. Similarly, right now the conversation going around is that how do we manage the 15% and how are we going to harness or, or, or be able to engage with KRA to ensure that uh, people do not feel they have lost out on their investment. So maybe that, that's a discussion that needs to, 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 to happen a bit more. But um, my own view, I think there's, there's still a bit of a challenge there. Peter Mwagi, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure being here. I appreciate it. Thank you. That takes us to the close of our conversation on Business Redefined. We have been focusing specifically on matters regarding rent to own, how to contrast it from the mortgage route to home ownership. And at the tail end, we've touched on, on the latest development regarding the taxation regime, and that is the enhancement of the capital gains tax from 5% to 15%. We shall continue highlighting these issues for the sake of the public. Stay tuned. <laughs>